The 1950s were a simpler time. Paint contained lead, cars had no restrictions for children, and toys didn't have much safety testing. That meant molten glass, molten metal, hazardous chemicals, all were included in toys back then. That too, on purpose. And if a kid was too dumb to play with the toy the right way, well, he'd just have to learn to get along with one less eye or arm. Join us as we look at some of the grisliest toys of the 1950s, all of which have been banned, except one. One even gave instructions on how to build an atomic bomb. So stay tuned. When you talk to people about chemistry sets, there's a strong chance, if they're familiar with it, a nostalgic glaze will come over their eyes. Chemistry sets were first invented in the 18th century, but it took more than a century for them to become popular among the general population. The early chemistry sets work with the idea of surprising classmates with a magic show. By the 1920s and 1930s, children got access to chemicals that today's more safety-conscious society would find questionable. There were poisonous components, like insecticides, as well as substances presently found in bombs and thought to increase the risk of cancer. The chemistry set was so widely used during this time period that makers frequently bragged about finding them in every house on every street in America. Even instructions and materials to be able to blow glass at high temperatures were included in certain chemistry sets. Ten-year-olds could build their own batteries and engines, make objects go boom, and use alcohol lamps to bend glass. The chemistry set's heyday was short-lived due to the 1960s emphasis on safety. Alcohol lamps and acids were taken out of chemistry set kits when the Federal Hazardous Compounds Labeling Act of 1960 made it mandatory to label the items for poisonous and harmful substances. If you've never played javelin darts, or lawn darts as they're often known, it's a game where players throw weighted spikes into the air in the hopes that they will land in a plastic circle that is put a few yards away. With the exception of metal spikes falling from the sky in place of beanbags, it was essentially the same game as horseshoes or cornhole. The history of lawn darts can be traced back to a plumbata, an ancient Greek and Roman battle weapon. Plumbata were weighted spikes that were thrown from a distance with the purpose of landing somewhere soft. They are believed to have first appeared approximately 500 BCE. They were tossed even in the same manner. It goes without saying that the ancient Romans did not have a plastic circle in mind. Despite being an actual weapon of war, toy producers started making them in the 1950s because they thought they would make a great family lawn game. It didn't take long for the javelin darts to show their shadowy dark side. Injuries during the game often occurred over the ensuing few decades. Even a young girl of seven years old was killed by one in 1987, and the girl's father dedicated his life to getting the game outlawed. If you haven't played the game, there's a solid reason for it. The United States Consumer Product Safety Commission outlawed lawn darts in America in 1988 due to the serious risk they posed. This ban had to be reissued in 1997, and people were urged to destroy the game. In the 1950s, parents dismissed whatever concerns they had about their kids. The reasoning behind this was that if young Billy and Susan couldn't survive their toys, perhaps they weren't strong enough to survive in the real world. Hence, they'd buy the kids toys that would make modern parents shudder. Case in point, the most deadly toy ever, Atomic Energy Lab Kit. This kit was actually sold to young children. This child's toy's name wasn't exaggerated. It actually emitted low radiations. The Atomic Energy Lab was one of the most complex science kits on the market when it first came out in 1950. There were four uranium containers in the Atomic Energy Lab Kit. It also included beta-alpha, beta, and gamma radiation sources, an ionizing particle cloud chamber, a spintheroscope to observe atoms in the process of decay, an electroscope to look for electric charges on the body, and a Geiger counter to measure radiation. At the very least, some of the radiation caused issues for household pets. The lab, which cost $50, also came with a 60-page instruction manual and a manual on uranium mining. Wait. There's more. Children could come up with 150 unique experiments with the Atomic Energy Lab Kit, perfect for the house's future Victor Frankenstein, or Lex Luthor. A comic book featuring Dagwood from the well-known Blondie comic strip was also included with the package. 
Its title was Learn How Dagwood Splits the Atom, and it was created in collaboration with General Leslie Groves, the project's director. Finally, the 1966 Child Protection Act outlawed the selling of toys containing dangerous materials. Never again will there be uranium-themed gifts under the Christmas tree. Radar Magazine aptly named the Atomic Energy Lab one of the most dangerous toys of all time in 2006. Not really a toy, but it's important to note that television has played such a significant role in modern life since it overtook radio as the most popular mass media in the 1950s that for some, it is difficult to picture life without it. Even though the television was a wonderful invention, nothing is ever without flaws. In the start, television makers were unaware of the potentially fatal interaction between electricity, wood, inadequate ventilation, and inadequate insulation. Examples include the electrocution of a four-year-old because of the inadequate loudspeaker insulation and an accidentally left on TV that overheated and started a house fire. In order to incorporate more safety measures, the House Secretary introduced a new British standard specification for TV sets. Tens of millions of televisions were being made by the early 1960s because the benefits of owning one outweighed the drawbacks by a wide margin. Never would a responsible adult permit a child to use a power tool. Power saws, power sanders, and drills fall under this category. After all, if used carelessly, power tools can pose serious risks to persons of all ages. But wait, what if the concerned power tools were made a little smaller than normal? Surely then they'd be safe for children, right? The Powermite Power Tool brand of toys, which debuted in the late 1960s, at least appeared to have been designed with that in mind. Technically speaking, these instruments were only intended to slash through thin wooden sheets, but it also doesn't take much force to saw off the tip of a finger. These tiny, useless tools just couldn't possibly provide any advantage to full-scale woodworking that would justify the risk of owning them, which is probably the reason they were banned after a few years. That toy's burn markings pretty much says it all. That is the 1930s or 1940s electric toy stove that could be plugged in and heated up, which is not only risky, but also entirely useless. What are you expected to heat in there? Food? Peanuts? Your brother's mutilated hamster? Electrical kitchen toys were actually rather popular in the 1950s, since it was necessary to teach your daughter about the risks associated with being a housewife and preparing her for the role. It would be negligent not to. No wonder, then, that small irons, coffee makers, toasters, and other appliances with names like Sunny Susie or Little Deb were offered in stores. Even the companies that prided themselves on being safer than the competition, their irons would heat up to 250 degrees, which is 40% hotter than boiling water. The Austin Magic Pistol, manufactured in the 1950s, allowed you to shoot plastic balls at friends. You could shoot them at other objects as well, but why would you want that when you could physically hurt your sibling, right? Was there a loaded spring inside or something else to make it work? No, not really. The magic crystals, which were actually hazardous chemicals, were combined with water in the gun's chamber to fire the balls. Calcium carbide produces flammable gas when it interacts with liquid, which is why it is listed on various hazardous materials list. This is not an unintended consequence the toy's creators could not have imagined. This is what they wanted, and that was the exact way the balls were supposed to be fired. Every time your gentle child's fingers pulled the trigger, the toy pistol literally exploded within, sending the ball flying up to 70 feet away. Toys were just built differently in the mid-20th century. Surprisingly, there weren't as many accidents as you would think. Have you ever seen any of these toys in real life? Let us know in the comments.